Hello, guys. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Well, if I want to make you the host. Okay, that's fine. Oh. I think we are set now. Yeah, Prof, you are the host now. Yeah, what I would like us to do is let's take some five minutes. Everybody should put on their video so we can see each other. And then we need to ourselves. Is, is that okay? Yeah, that's fine, Prof. Some of you, your connection might be bad, so but. Uh, it will just be for this five minutes. So at least we see each other, know who is who is who. And then, uh, so each one of you. Whilst you're not talking, I mute your mic. So when, we, when your time comes, you switch on your mic and you tell, tell us about yourself. Who you are, where you come from, you know, where, what has brought you onto the program, why you onto the program, and, and then we move on. Okay, so this part. Yeah, Prof. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, okay, your voice is oh. coming. So, all right. So I'm Bess McDonald, and I'm I'm a research assistant at UG, working on computational. Okay. I'm a research assistant at Noguchi. Okay. Noguchi Medical Institute. Around. Okay, that's, mm, yeah, yeah, and mm. I work on computational drug discovery. So because of what I work on, I decided to join the computer science program in order to enhance my knowledge and my research. Too. So that's why I joined the program. Where did you get your first degree from? Um, from the School of Engineering, University of Oh, I see. So you completed for UG? Yes, please. TA. No, I'm not a TA. I was in the TA. Yes, I said you did your undergraduate at UG, isn't it? Yes, I did my undergraduate at UG, School of Engineering. Yeah, which year, yeah, which year did you complete? Um, 2017. Okay, so you did computer engineering? No, I did okay. biomedical engineering. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. So, okay. Richmond. Hi. Hi, Prof. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm Richmond. Richmond, yeah. Um, a little bit about myself. So I graduated University of Ghana 2018. Um, I currently have work as an IT auditor at PwC Ghana. Sorry? Uh, I currently work as an IT auditor at PwC Ghana. Okay. Yes. Department did you complete from? Um, IT. Department of Computer Science, IT. Computer Science. All right. Yeah. And you, you don't have enough of us to come back and get more? Sorry, please come again. We didn't terrorize you enough to stay you away. Uh, no, we got along pretty much okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, James. I currently work at uh, National Board for Professional Technician Examination as the IT manager. Okay. I completed school at the University of Science and Technology, Tapa, in 2016. Okay. Okay. No, I, I didn't hear the question. Why did, what brought you to UG? Why did you decide on UG? Well, uh, 
right after school, I've been into uh, software development and other, you know, system administration. Ma! I'm currently looking at switching from that field into uh, data. So that is the more reason why I decided to join UG. Okay. Right. Thank you. Zuleha. Hello. Hi. Please, good evening. Good evening. I am Zuleha Dobia Abdullah. Okay. Um, I completed Uni um, University for Development Studies in 2017. Okay. I offered computer with accounting. Mm -hmm. And I currently work as an IT auditor with the Ghana Audit Service. Okay, excellent. So why do you decide to come and do this? Why do you leave the north and come down to the south to come and listen to our rubbish? <laughs> okay, well, um, I've always been in the south. I just went to the north to go and <laughs> study. Okay. Um, I always wanted to be in Legon, but I didn't get the opportunity with my undergrad. So okay. I felt like it would be a very good place mm -hmm. to start with Legon. And hopefully we'll continue from here because I think it's a very great institution and I want to be disciplined like a Lego knight. Mm -hmm. But you know, we, we, we bully people at Lego, if you know that. I'm up for the challenge. Yeah. I don't Very see good. it as bullying. I see it because as we, grooming. We, we terrorize people a lot, especially in my department. We are terrorists. You know? We are very good at it's that. Grooming. <laughs> it's grooming. It's <laughs> grooming. All right, you are welcome. Thank you so much. Asari. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, it, it was very big. I completed US, uh, KNUST in 2008. Mm. Uh, I'm a developer at the Society General Ghana. Okay. Well, why did you decide to come to Lagos from KNUST? You could have done this at KNUST. You know, we are right now. Well, and, we, and we hate to see KST guys. If you see them, we fight them. I don't know. I, I don't think that. I think if closer to home, that's why. <laughs> All right, then. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. And Prince? Prince Kotoko. Okay. Uh, Prof, good evening. Good evening. Can we see your face? Oh, okay. Just for a minute, and then you can switch it off again. At least, yes, then we know who you are. Okay. So I left uh, Legon in uh, 2010. Okay. I read computer science and math. So that's basically me. I, I now run a small IT and real estate company. Wow. So then why are you coming to do a master's in computer science? You are doing the estate business. There's a lot of money to be made today. Uh, I'm actually combining I, uh, IT and real estate. I'm leveraging on IT, so I need the IT. I need okay. the computer science. Yes. All right. Thank you. Atra. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'm a teacher to come my school. I'm a teacher to come my school. I'm a teacher to come my school. Yeah, I completed. I don't know why. UUW. 2011. But since then, I've been teaching at my school. Mathematics and elective ICT. You think this program is going to help you? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it will help me. Where I want my, where my, my, where I want to be, uh, I think the computer science, uh, it will help me. Okay, thank you. So I guess you are all sort of working, so to say. 
Please, all right. Please Let's go to Martin. Okay. Martin. Martin, we can't hear you. You have to unmute so that we can hear you. We can't hear you at all. Let me skip you. No, we can't hear you. We still can't hear you. Right. So what we can do in the chat, in the chat with the box, you can tell us about yourself in the chat box, and then you can do it. Because we can't hear you. And there's a lot of feedback. I mean, Find your introduction, just type in a bit about yourselves in the chat line. And at the end, if there are any comments, I can look at those and then come back. Is that okay? Is, is the line here? Let me see if I of something. The line is clear because there's a lot of noise in the line. I can hear a lot of noise. Gone now. Can you all hear me clearly? Yes, sir. Excellent. Right. So now, uh, normally, if I have a class like this, this uh, class is about uh, mobile and wireless systems. Maybe I'll just ask two people who haven't spoken yet, any two who haven't spoken yet, tell me briefly what their expectation of this course is. Before, I mean, what, what do you think it's about? Just any two people. Okay, I'll, let's start from uh, who, do, where did we stop? Uh, I don't think we've heard from IAT. Have we? We stop after Martin. So, Eric, can you tell us what do you think the course is about? Um, thank you, sir. I believe um, it's, it's going to deal mainly about. Um, mobile applications, basically devices that use um, wireless um, this in communication, and then probably looking at, going to look at the principles that govern um, mm -hmm. such devices and how best they can enhance communication. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. All right. Okay, what about uh, Hunes? Uh, Anthony, what's that? what are your views? Anthony, though, what do you think? Anthony, what do you think the course is about? Anthony, if you are speaking, we can't hear you. Or at least I cannot hear you. All right, let's leave Anthony. Atta, Atto, what do you think, me? What do you think the course is about? If you, we can't hear you, your mic is muted, so we can't hear you. No, this is not working. Your uh, Apple, your mic is muted, so we can't hear you. Apple, right, Mr. Dupoku. Hello? 
Yes. So this is Atu. Okay, Atu, go ahead. Um, I'm looking at uh, how how mobile mobile systems, uh, wireless and mobile systems can can integrate and finding challenges and solving them. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay. Mr. Dupoku, why do you think this is important? Assuming what they've said is true, why do you think it's important? Okay, so, uh, please, this is uh, Dupoku. Uh, so I believe the world is moving towards a wireless um, era when it comes to even our mobile handsets, even some way some of our cars that we use. Uh, most of our computer systems are moving towards the mobile uh, wireless system era instead of the, the cord and everything. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Now, I mean, you've all said things that are sort of uh, relevant, interesting, but uh, I suppose we all need to have a certain common uh, uh, basics for wanting to do this course or at least um, a common understanding of what we are going to gain from this course. I'll begin by, well, my name is Ferdinand Kachuku and I'll be leading you in this course. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen so that we can begin to look at some of the uh, concepts for, uh, uh, for ourselves. Right, so, mm, so yes, this course is on the principles that underpin wireless and mobile systems. So we are going to look at the, well, yes, like, like someone said, a lot of things are now becoming wireless and mobile and uh, you no, know, but, but why? We, and we'll look at some of these reasons why a bit later on. Uh, let me ask, is the class being recorded? Okay. Yes, it is. Yeah. So that we can have a record of that later on, that people can play back. Um, so wireless systems are becoming commonplace. One of the reasons is that uh, the cost of laying cables to connect places is prohibitive. So wireless systems offer you an opportunity to overcome that heavy initial cost uh, investment. So what you want to so because of this. People are adopting wireless systems everywhere. And there are many other reasons I'll, I'll look at them later. Uh, so the course is supposed to make you understand the principles that underpin the design of wireless systems. Right. Uh, so we're going to look at the principles. What, what are the concepts, the key issues that underpin these systems so that you can use them to design any mobile system. Uh, we are not uh, physicists, so we will not be looking at the nature of these things. We are not electrical engineers, so we will not be looking at the, the, the design of the devices and so on. Uh, but uh, our lesson is to be able to use them. But in order to use them, we need to understand them. We need to understand how they work. Without a good understanding of the way these things will work, uh, you will not be able to make uh, good use of them. To begin with, we have these systems so that we can communicate, right? Uh, the reason why you communicate is so that you can share information with each other. You know, now, when you communicate, communicating is not simply one person talking, right? But it's important that the other person is able to make sense, receive what, the, what one person is saying and make sense out of it. So, I mean, like the class we have now, we are, we are communicating, but is that the best form? Because in many instances, I don't even know whether you've received what I'm saying, whether what I'm communicating to you is, uh, uh, is making sense, you know, is getting to you. Because of the very nature of the application we are using, you know, if we're in a classroom setting, then I can see your faces, the expressions on your face. Then I'll know that uh, yes, you are following or you are not following. Yeah. 
So we communicate in order to share information, you know. So when you build a communication system, you then want to be able to what? Distribute information uh, from one place to another, you know. Now, sending this information can be, I mean, it's okay, but how? How do you do that? Well, there are many ways in which you can do that, you know. But we realize it's known that using signals, you know, is a better way of doing that. And signaling has always been a way of getting information across. Because with signaling, you can get information to a much longer distances, you know, than if you were just shouting or talking. Then in reality, wireless communication actually predates wired communication systems. You know, uh, so uh, yeah, wireless communication predates uh, wired communication systems long before the advent of the wire wire lines. You know, people used to communicate using smoke signals, and you have I said that the smoke signaling is a form of what wireless communication. Long before the wire lines, our great grandparents used to beat drums. You know, so if your village is under attack, then there was a way they drum so that you know that there was something happening. You know, either come back home and defend the village or don't return now, the women should stay in the field or something. So, wireless uh, communications predates our wide communication and the use of signals is, uh, uh, is the way to go about it, right? But uh, these signals can be in various forms, you know, you know, they can be either music, picture, or voice, or even computer data. But it's much more convenient to describe the signals, right, using uh, uh, electrical signaling. So it's not simply the signal, but you also need to encode the signal. So the information has to be encoded onto the signal. And then you then have to transmit that signal. And then at the other end, you need to what, decode the signal and reproduce the original signal and the message that is meant for the intended uh, recipient. So normally we would do various forms of signals, but um, a typical analog signal will look like a picture above, you know, so it's not smooth or anything. So this is what would normally be, you call maybe your message signal. This signal actually contains the actual information, right? But then to actually get the signal across, engineers then generate, you know, some other signals sinusoids and then the information you have is then superimposed on this sinusoid and then transmitted uh, to the intended destination one second All right so for any communication system, there are a number of elements. You have the, what do you call it? The transmitter, the channel, the receiver. And so those are the basic elements of any communication system. Right. We can go on and talk about this communication system uh, one second. We can go ahead and talk about this, but you need to understand that if you have a company, something like that, then what does what role does each of these things play in your communication system? So if you take the block diagram, the source is where the signal or the message signal is coming from. The transmitter is that one which would actually 
propagate, take this information and send out where you want it to go. And then the channel is the medium to which this signal will travel to the intended destination. And then the receiver is again that device that uh, would receive the signal and then to the destination. But there's an important thing to note in this diagram that under the channel, you have a box there that goes and shows noise. And for rest, that is an important aspect of it. So since you are not engineers, you are not actually going to be looking at the transmitter, how to design the transmitter, right? Again, you're not engineers. You're not going to be looking at how to do design the receiver. Yeah, we may have to look at antennas because they play an important role in reception. But for you to be able to do your work properly, you need to understand what happens in the channel. So the channel is an important thing that we want to understand. What are the characteristics of this channel that make it you know, uh, uh, worthy of study? that imposes the restraints, the constraints we have. So the channel has some peculiar characteristics. Now we can, all right, I'll come to it. So the channel has some peculiar characteristics that uh, would impact on the nature of our communication system. So it is this channel that we are interested in. You know, so, but for any communication system, that channel, right, need not be, uh, uh, that channel, the channel can be actually divided into two forms, the guided one, and then the free propagation. Yeah. So in guided, that, that channel is a transmission line. It can be a fiber, it can be a coaxial cable, or some UTP cable, some form of cable. Yeah. And the information is then guided along this channel to the destination. So that the information goes over what? A, a secured medium, yeah? But then for wireless communication, the information actually, the channel is a space, is the air around us. You know, is the air. So it is not guided, it goes anywhere. And that has certain implications. For one, it can go in any direction. Two, anybody with an appropriate device can tap into the system or the channel and then retrieve the information that we are, we are, we are, we are what, uh, transmitting. You know, um, but, but then, let me ask you an interesting question. No, I've been asking this question for a number of years now. Nobody has given me an answer. So if you don't know the answer, don't worry. But you can keep it at the back of your mind. You can write it down. Right. And the question is as follows. Um, supposing that your phone, the phone you have, yeah, is cloned. Right? What does that mean? It means that someone has a set copy of your, of your SIM card in another phone. Right? This is what I mean, that it's been cloned. Right. And assuming that I wanted to place a call to you and you are in Accra, when I place a call, you will what? Re receive information, isn't it? You receive the call and you'll be able to answer my questions. Assuming that uh, so the person with your cloned phone is in Tamale or Navrongo. You would admit that since the distance is cloned, that person can also receive the information, isn't it? I'm assuming that you are all saying yes. Yeah. Because he has a clone phone. So you in Accra will receive that same call. The person in Tamale would also receive that same call. But then we agree that since there's a uh, a distance between you, the time it takes for that person to receive your call will be slightly different from the time you receive the call. Supposing that we move the clone phone somewhere further again, now not uh, 800 miles away from Accra, 
met 8,000 miles, the person will still receive the call. My question is how far will the, the distance go you know, before you no longer receive the call? So the time difference now may no longer be uh, one second. It can be extended to one hour. Or yes, two days or something. Does that mean that when you place a call, yeah, at any time, the information that call is still out there in the atmosphere that anybody with the with the I mean the, the the appropriate device can still pick up that information because you have someone you have received a call already in a, in Accra, but someone in Avrongo can still receive the same call because the thing is just transmitted to the air. So that's my thing. Think about it as we go along. Right. For very early uh, mobile systems or wireless systems, what was happening was that uh, companies would put a very powerful transmitter on the highest point, that's a mountain, and then they would then broadcast to a large area. This was excellent, it was good but it had certain shortcomings. And these shortcomings had to do with the resources that they were using, which was a spectrum. And they realized that this was not very helpful. So they had to move away from this concept to another concept of what is known as the cellular systems. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. You talk about your cell phone. But when you say cell phone, you're actually referring to a cellular phone, a phone that works based on a cellular system. So rather than you know, have one powerful transmitter, you have small transmitters, each covering a very small area. Yeah. So that the power within that transmitter cannot go outside of a certain region. And this means that you can then reuse that frequency in another region. And this is what it is about. And we'll look at that uh, a bit later. So the diagram you see here shows you that concept of cells, right? Where in each cell you have base stations. And that base station covers the area of that cell. Mind you, in real life, it's not exactly hexagonal as you see it. But these hexagons are used in order to work, enable us to work, conceptualize the, concept, uh, the ideas and be able to understand them, and that is all. Something that at least worried me, you know, for a long time, is that uh, I mean, if you have uh, what do you call it, your mobile phone, you're able to call someone on a landline. And you all know what I mean by one line. You know, the telephone that is fixed to a copper cable in a house somewhere, which used to be the way things work. Yeah. So, oh, uh, yeah. So you can make a call to your other house. I mean, how, that was like 30 years ago. I used to, how does that happen? You know, because mine is wireless. And then somehow I can, how, how do I get connected to? the wired line, when that wired device, you know, hasn't got, you know, uh, wireless adapters, you know, to them. And the answer lies in the way that the cellular system is designed, that this infrastructure. So what you see is that you have your cells, right? And this cell, each cell has a base station and several, a number of these cells are then connected. So if you take that diagram, so all these cells, all these base station in these cells will be controlled by one uh, big power known as a base station controller, yeah? So that base station controller has control over all these cells here. So all the cells will be controlled by one base station controller and a number of base station controllers will be linked to a mobile switching center. And then this mo a number of these mobile switching centers then are then connected to the public switch telephone network, 
which is a traditional network. So this is how it is possible for you to make a call from your mobile phone to a phone that is not a mobile phone, but it's connected to what? A wired line. Basically, at the base station, uh, you have a number of uh, channels. You know, you have the control channels and then you have the traffic channels and they have some specific rules to play. So you have the forward control channel, the reverse control channel, the traffic channel, the forward traffic channel, and the uh, reverse traffic channel. And I suppose that from the distance, you know exactly what each one will do. Now, let's look at the components of a cellular system. What are the components, you know, what constitutes, so the, so we, in a new cellular system, you have your mobile unit or your mobile station, which is remote, the phone you are holding, right? And then you have your base stations, and then you also have the mobile switching centers, right? Your, the phone you have, the generic phones, would uh, basically have an antenna. These days, you don't see the antenna because the, the of uh, the antennas are not uh, what you can meet as poles now. You know, technology has advanced, so you can have them as patches at the top of, and then even sometimes inside the phone. So you don't see them. You know, by like 15, 20 years ago, they were actually uh, poles that you can pull out, you know, uh, like you see on cars. So the antenna is responsible for receiving and transmitting the signals. So the antenna uh, can either receive a signal or it can transmit signal into the atmosphere. So when the signal comes, it goes through a duplexer. The duplexer will determine whether the signal is an incoming signal or an outgoing signal. Then from the duplexer, the, what do you call it? The signal will go to the linear uh, low noise amplifier a demodulator to your signal processor, decoder, and then to your speaker so you can hear it. If the signal is also meant to be going out, then it goes the reverse, it goes to a coder, signal processor, pulse shaper, modulator, but this time a power amplifier before it goes out. So every phone would look something like that, right? You are not really, you are not designers, if you're electrical, uh, Electronics uh, science, I mean, electronic engineers, that's what the, and we might be looking in details at the circuits of this, each of these things here, how the, how the, how the circuits are designed. So at master's level, then we'll be thinking about how, what improvements do we make? What are the new challenges in those areas? So those are the sort of things we're looking at. So each of you might be working on a different area. So we'll have look at the circuitry of each part of each of these things here. But we are not that. But you must just have an idea and know that oh, this is what is actually inside your phone. And at the base station, again, you have a duplexer because the base station must receive signals and it must give out signals. And just like your phone, it will go through a low noise amplifier that does because the signals coming in may be what? Very low noise. And I will do some calculations so you appreciate how small the value of these signals are then it must again go to some, uh, listen to split the signals into either RF received signals or transmit signals, then before it goes to the receiver and transmit to the, uh, to the mobile switching centers. Uh, and then on the other hand, if the signal is go out, then it goes to a power amplifier before it is sent out. So um, there are many terms that you come across you know, ad hoc networks, you know, wireless sensor networks. Ad hoc networks simply are, you know, networks that are formed, you know, uh, on the fly. So you meet up, each of you has a phone and, you know, your phones connect to each other and form a network, you know. And uh, these kind of networks are also wireless. And so they are important. Then we also have a, uh, the wireless sensor networks, which are new forms of networks that are coming. And they've been spared on by development. That's where people want to get things done. Let's say uh, we want to know 
the what do you call it? The water parameters of the Volta Lake, the Volta River, right? So what would have done normally would have been for us to take a boat or a car, travel along the, the course of the river and take, uh, take samples along the course of the river. And then we bring those samples, double these samples, bring them back to Accra, and then we take them to the lab, and then we do analysis, and then we say, okay, this is the water quality as at that time. But you can appreciate that. That by the time you go and collect the samples and come back, the information you have about the water is outdated. It might take you two weeks to do that. So all the information you've collected is outdated. So rather than that, you can actually plant sensors along the river bank, right? Or in the river. And these sensors, we then have wireless devices attached to them. And this then, the sensors will pick up this uh, uh, data. Uh, there'll be different types of sensors. If it's a pH sensor or the BT sensor or whatever parameter it wants to sense, it will do that sensing and then wirelessly transmit that data to your central office. I mean, you can imagine. So in this case, you don't have to go anywhere, but you are sitting in your office and you know the exact water quality at any specific time. I mean, it's amazing. You know, so these uh, all forms of lessons are the same in Boron. But then even before we go on, uh, all right. <laughs> Before we go, we say, okay, we have a, a wireless sensor. This is, there's, there's a video that I wanted to show you. Let me actually check and see if I can show you that. Uh, this thing. Ah, look at me. So give me one second here. Yeah? There's a, something that I wanted to show you how to write. All right. So everything we do is based on what? Modulation. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes here, yeah? in a few minutes. Uh, but what am I expecting from you, from this course? What are the things that I'm expecting from you? Well, I want you to be able to, at the end of this course, be able to identify and discuss the fundamental operational and design problems of wireless communication systems. So you must know the things that have to do with, you know, the design of such systems. Be able to apply the basic techniques to design radio links. And then the radio links here, <laughs> excuse me, by radio links, I'm referring to the channel so you understand the channel and how to actually uh, design that channel. Because actually when you say design it, it means that how, uh, the sort of transmission parameters you set so that you can get your data out there, this thing uh, in, uh, with good quality. You should also be able to understand the mathematics involved uh, uh, to solve these engineering design problems. Also be able to set up experiments that would analyze the performance of wireless systems. Be able to discuss, I don't think you can cover all of these things, but be able to discuss some of the basic technical standards that are related to wireless systems. You know, the standards are related to Wi-Fi and sensor networks. Uh, understand physical lizard design, and then be able to model radio systems, simulate them, and importantly, be able to investigate some of the system trade-offs. Now, the question you'll be asking, okay, we are coming to the what is going to happen. Yeah, this is a course, it's an investing course, so we're going to assess you. But because of the very nature of the semester, uh, the assessment is slightly different. Your end of semester exams, unlike previous times, will constitute 40%. So your continuous assessment will be what, 60%, which means that you'll be given assignments on a regular basis and I expect you to what, undertake those assignments and 
So if you don't Google them, it means that you'll be losing mass as you go along. Right, so this will come in the form of multiple choice questions, exercises, presentations, mid terms, you know, and then also your own individual project or presentation, you know, to, and then your final exam. There are quite a number of interesting books, uh, but most of the information you get from me in class, but Stallings is a, a good book. Then there's another one, uh, which I think I would normally say, if you go to get a book, then you should get that one, but it's by, Rapport, TS Rapport, Wireless Communications, Principles and Practice. It's an excellent book, you know, so it's a book that you may want to buy and keep. You know, as, as at this level, you should, be, you should own some books, you know, you should have some books. All right, so then, I've talked about a lot of few things, but then if you say wireless, what, what does it really, really mean if it's something wireless? You know, wireless, you know, in uh, short form means that it doesn't want any physical wires. But what we are referring to here is radio waves, right? We all know about waves, about uh, the waves on the water, et cetera. But if you say a wave, yeah, can anybody define a wave for me? Say what a wave is? Anybody who attempt to say a wave? I mean, what's your understanding of a wave? Anybody who venture? Yes, Lord? Uh, sir, um, before I answer that, um, your voice is a bit low, so we can have- Come again. I said your voice. Is now it's a bit low. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. So you told uh, me long ago. You can um, um, bring up your voice a bit. You know, I think I'm, I was a bit far from the mic. That's why. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, so I was asking, what do you understand by a wave? Um. To my understanding, uh, wave is a form of um, uh, it, it, it's a form of uh, air or a signal which can be detected by uh, an electronic device. Light. Yeah, I, I think that's what I can say for now. You see, if you say a wave, basically what you mean is that is, is the transport of energy, yeah? Yeah. From one place to the other. So you move energy you transfer energy from one point to the other without any physical connection. That's what a wave is. Yeah. So this phenomenon had been known since the 1800s, you know, and the work started with people like uh, Tesla and Hertz and Co. and then McCorney, you know, who showed that you can actually move energy from one point to the other. And if you can move and measure this energy, then you can code it with information and then use it to uh, pass information around. And this one led to the development of the telegraph. But why, 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 wireless, why wireless? Why do we need wireless systems? Why the need for wireless systems? The reasons are many, but amongst them is the fact that wireless systems, one second. Hmm. My mouth is misbehaving. Wireless systems afford mobility, right? If 
we are wireless, it means that you are not feathered to any point. You can be moving around and doing your work. And there are many people that, uh, Lord, you still have a question? Your hand is up. All right. Yeah, so while the systems are for people, there are many workers, people whose work requires that they are out, out and about, but then you still need, need to be connected. So with a wireless system, you can be out and about and be connected and be doing your work. You know, so you don't have to uh, sacrifice connectivity, you know, for anything else. So wireless networks gives you a great deal of mobility. There are some other good reasons. So for example, um, uh, if wireless systems enable you to extend the coverage of your network beyond the confines of some specific place. So if you're a company, uh, you can easily move your uh, connectivity to cover all the buildings without necessarily having to wear them. And then there are some buildings uh, which are known as uh, uh, heritage sites that they prohibit you to do any uh, innovations on them or to try and touch them in any way. So you can't go to those buildings and then start wiring them, you know, uh, chiseling and you can't do that. So for those type of buildings, uh, what do you call it? Wireless systems are the perfect solution. And of course, wireless systems also takes out all the, uh, minimizes the infrastructure costs. There are no cables for you to buy and lay. So it makes life quite simple. And because of that, they can be used in disaster, uh, disaster recovery instances, you know, so if there's an earthquake somewhere, you can just simply go set up with this and there are no wires, no nothing. And then you have a communication place, uh, system in place you can use to communicate information to many places. Wire systems also enable you to uh, cover what? Long distances, even though it will be at low data rates. Yeah, you will still be able to uh, reach long distances. But there are a number of issues to do with uh, wireless systems. One, the links are much more complex than wireline systems. What do we mean by this? You see, if you have a, a copper wire, a quasia, uh, a quasia cable or a fiber, then you know the exact specifications of that fiber. You know its purity. So you know the quality of the link, right? So if you put data down it, you know exactly what will happen to that data as it goes along. But for a wireless uh, this link, you don't know these things. One minute, the channel is fine. The other minute is gone bad because maybe uh, suddenly it begins to rain. There's a storm. There's thunder and lightning somewhere. So it affects the quality of the link. These are things you don't know. You can't plan for them. You know, and importantly is that, another important aspect of this is that, uh, what do you call it? They have very limited spectrum. So I'm going to talk about spectrum, right? Uh, and what it is. And I'll show you a video on that as we go along, somewhere along the line. And I've also told you already that wireless communication systems are susceptible, susceptible to intersection because anybody with the right equipment can simply what, um, can simply uh, inter with the right equipment can, can pick up your signals and interpret them, right? One second.
Right. Uh. Now, so what is what is a spectrum? So a wireless system is is, is uh, based on spectrum. But what is it? You know, first of all, we talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. What is that electromagnetic spectrum? And uh, as part of that electromagnetic spectrum, we are focusing on radio waves because that is what we use for. Uh, the wireless, uh, wireless communication, right? So you, you are not physicists, so you, you are not really, really interested in the nature of these waves. But you need to know what we are talking about, what aspect of the spectrum we are using, and how are we using that. Why do we say that the spectrum is limited, right? So I would uh, take you to this. Can you all see my screen? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay, so yes, two yes. Yeah, we can see. So I'm going to show you a video. You can watch that. Something surrounds you, bombards you, some of which you can't see, touch, or even feel. Every day, everywhere you go, it is odorless and tasteless, yet you use it and depend on it every hour of every day. Without it, the world you know could not exist. What is it? Electromagnetic radiation. These waves spread across a spectrum from very short gamma rays to X-rays ultraviolet rays, visible light waves, even longer infrared waves, microwaves, radio waves, which can measure longer than a mountain range. This spectrum is the foundation of the information age and of our modern world. Your radio, remote control, text message, television, microwave oven, even a doctor's x-ray, all depend on waves within the electromagnetic spectrum. Electromagnetic waves, or EM waves, are similar to ocean waves in that both are energy waves. They transmit energy. EM waves are produced by the vibration of charged particles and have electrical and magnetic properties. But unlike ocean waves that require water, EM waves travel through the vacuum of space at the constant speed of light. EM waves have crests and troughs like ocean waves. The distance between crests is the wavelength. While some EM wavelengths are very long and are measured in meters, many are tiny and are measured in billions of a meter, nanometers. The number of these crests that pass a given point within one second is described as the frequency of the wave. One wave or cycle per second is called a hertz. Long EM waves, such as radio waves, have the lowest frequency and carry less energy. Adding energy increases the frequency of the wave and makes the wavelength shorter. Gamma rays are the shortest, highest energy waves in the spectrum. So, as you sit watching TV, not only are there visible light waves from the TV striking your eyes, but also radio waves transmitting from a nearby station and microwaves carrying cell phone calls and text messages and waves from your neighbor's Wi-Fi and GPS units in the cars driving by. There is a chaos of waves from all across the spectrum passing through your room right now. With all these waves around you, how can you possibly watch your TV show? Similar to tuning a radio to a specific radio station, our eyes are tuned to a specific region of the EM spectrum and can detect energy with wavelengths from 400 to 700 nanometers, the visible light region of the spectrum. Objects appear to have color because EM waves interact with their molecules. Some wavelengths in the visible spectrum are reflected and other wavelengths are absorbed. 
This leaf looks green because EM waves interact with the chlorophyll molecules. Waves between 492 and 577 nanometers in length are reflected, and our eye interprets this as the leaf being green. Our eyes see the leaf as green, but cannot tell us anything about how the leaf reflects ultraviolet, microwave, or infrared waves. To learn more about the world around us, scientists and engineers have devised ways to enable us to see beyond that sliver of the EM spectrum called visible light. Data from multiple wavelengths help scientists study all kinds of amazing phenomena on Earth, from seasonal change to specific habitats. Everything around us emits, reflects, and absorbs EM radiation differently based on its composition. A graph showing these interactions across a region of the EM spectrum is called a spectral signature. Characteristic patterns, like fingerprints within the spectra, allow astronomers to identify an object's chemical composition and to determine such physical properties as temperature and density. NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope observed the presence of water and organic molecules in a galaxy 3.2 billion light years away. Viewing our sun in multiple wavelengths with the SOHO satellite allows scientists to study and understand sunspots that are associated with solar flares and eruptions harmful to satellites, astronauts, and communications here on Earth. We are constantly learning more about our world and universe by taking advantage of the unique information contained in the different waves across the EM spectrum. Right, so you've seen that video. Basically, I've asked you, I want you to watch so you understand that the, what, what is surrounding us, the spectrum is something that surrounds us. There are waves coming from everywhere. They are naturally occurring waves from outer space. So they're all around us, okay? But the, the thing is that when, but we're only interested in one specific part. Yeah. So the rays extend from several, you know, uh, gigahertz to a few gigahertz. The part that we are interested in is the radio, uh, radio waves that are simply from, uh, radio waves are from about 30 hertz to about uh, 300 gigahertz. That's the wavelength, I mean, the frequency of a, a, a radio is from 30 hertz to about 300 uh, gigahertz, right? So, and that is just this part here. Now, there's a relationship between the frequency of a wave, of, uh, uh, the frequency and the wavelength, and you should know that relationship, I'm not going to tell you. So we are interested in this part of it, this part, the radio is which I'm showing here. The, the, so what I'm trying to say is that, you see, if you are using a particular frequency, then that frequency is no longer available for any other person to use. Yeah? You can use that frequency, you can use it as long as you like, it will not finish, but it is no longer there. So once you've occupied that lane, you've occupied it. Nobody else can occupy it. And the thing is that there are many people wishing to use these same frequencies. So we say that the, uh, the spectrum is limited, yeah? Because there isn't much of it to go around. So uh, governments, you know, uh, companies have to pay for them to use them. You know, so if if you uh, uh, you, uh, you are not licensed to use a specific design, then uh, you get into trouble. But the question is that well, if the radio rays are limited, why don't we move to some other end and use those rays there? Of course, we do use those uh, other ends. We do use the waves there. So we use microwaves. We use infrared. We use a visible. Uh, light as well, we use those ones. Yeah. But then we use X-rays and gamma rays, but why don't you use them for, for communication? That's a good question. 
but the answer lies in the ability of the technologies we have to actually use them for communications. The device to build those devices is a challenge that can communicate, uh, transmit data at those distances because there's much greater bandwidth there. You know, uh, it's a huge challenge. And this is what is uh, stopping us from exploiting those fully. Okay, so there is there are a number of things which are important, you know, for any uh, wireless system. I've been saying that it's a radio environment which is key. In the radio environment, there are a number of things we have to look at. Propagation path loss. What does that mean? What it means is that when you send a signal, as a signal travels from one end to the other, it would encounter losses. Yeah, it will encounter losses because it's like uh, if you're talking to people, the closer the person is to you, the clearer they will hear you. But as the person moves away, your signal, the, the, the level will diminish and they will not hear you clearly. So the same way. So as a signal travels away from its source, it will suffer loss, propagation loss. And I'll show you how we actually calculate that so that you know exactly how much is left of the original signal. And then there's the issue to do with fading. Fading simply means that, uh, how do you call it? Loss, temporary loss of signal. And you've all experienced this, you know, where uh, you speak on a mobile phone and temporarily you can't hear, you know, uh, you can't hear the person. We call that fade. Or even when you tune into a radio station, you are listening and then the signal fades off and then comes back, you know. Uh, Doppler shift is got to do with movement, where you are moving at a certain speed. Because the very fact you are moving, it affects the frequency and that can cause issues for your system. And then there are issues to do with co-channel interference where I'm using one channel, another person is using a similar channel a distance apart from me. But then because it's the same channel, the, there's a likelihood that sometimes there can be overlaps and interference. And then of course there are issues to do also with adjusting channel interference where Channels that are close to each other can interfere. And then there's man-made noise, you know, noise from the environment. The, you know, if you are living in an urban environment, you know, how that impacts on your signal because the buildings, if you are living in a rural environment because of the trees, the mountains and other things, how that affects the, 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 the radio environment. So these are things you need to take into consideration and, and think about as we design your systems. So in the very first week, we get to look at, you know, uh, wireless systems in general, and this is what I've done. Then we'll talk about, you know, the components of a communication system, which I've sort of, you know, spoken to you about that. Then we'll talk about modulation, bandwidth requirements, you know, measure of information, channel capacity. So those are the things we'll talk about in the first week. I've started speaking on some of them already. I'll continue to look at modulation in this very first week. And then in the second week, I'll move on to talk about modulation techniques, the theory of amplitude modulation, single sideline uh, techniques, the theory of frequency modulation and so on. Then we'll talk about pulse modulation, pulse code modulation, you know, elements of uh, pulse code modulation, what, what are the key things, the quantization error, what it means, how noise affects uh, pulse code systems, channel capacity of pulse code systems. In the third week, I would like us to look at antennas and radio wave propagation. So briefly look at antenna theory, terms and definitions. Then an important part of the course will be to look at radio wave propagation. How does radio waves actually travel? The types of radio waves, the propagation mechanisms, 
free space propagation model, lab propagation. These are key things. Because if you don't understand these things, then you don't understand how wireless systems, the things that affect wireless systems when you set them up. So that's an important thing, an important aspect, which I'll give you to understand. Even if I didn't teach you anything at all, this is something that you should know. Then we'll look at uh, propagation characteristics of wireless channels, you know, path loss, fading, Doppler effect, delay spread, inter interference, coherence, bandwidth, and so on. Then we we'll then look at wireless systems design, the fundamental principles, so the cellular concept, uh, the hexagonal cell model, cells and cell area, signal strength, you know, cell capacity, you know, frequency reuse, what all those things mean, cell splitting, cell sectoring, how we, how we go about those things. All of these things are done in order to, uh, to increase capacity of the wireless system. Right. I'll give you an example. Let's say that, uh, what do you call it? MTN has designed a system to uh, handle, let's say, 20,000 students on University of Canada. Uh, mm -hmm. Then over the years, over the years, uh, the student population grows. So we don't longer have a 20,000 students, but we have 50,000 students. How has they redesigned the system? Now, they cannot go back and get more uh, bandwidth from uh, NCA. NCA will not get them. So then how do they, uh, what do you call it, uh, manage the system they have so that they can cope with the increased numbers? Then we'll look at radio access techniques, you know, contention-based protocols, pure aloha, slotted aloha, CSMA, all these, what are these things? You know, uh, we'll look at them. Then we'll look at channel location, static versus dynamic as a chair. Then we'll look at mobile communication systems, uh, infrastructure, handoff, you know, and so on. Uh, I'm not actually going to look at this. Well, DFPS, ISM, DFM, I'll talk about DSM, and the rest of the that. So that would be about it, uh, the sort of things I'm hoping to look at. Uh, I might look at a few recent advances, you know, uh, design issues in sensor networks, Bluetooth networks, low power design, etc. So that would be about it, you know, then we'll run off. Uh, because we are not going to have exactly the 11 weeks or so, I think we may have less. So we have to manage and do something so that we don't say, uh, yeah. So, yeah, so that brings me to the end of the discussion. Uh, as of now, there are a few things I want to talk about before we uh, close. Um, any questions, Tesfa? <clears throat> any questions? <laughs> Yes, sir. Hello. Yeah. Hello, sir. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, please. Uh, you made a uh, mention of uh, the, the frequencies being available, and then you have to purchase them before you can mm. have access to them. Mm. And uh, please, how do someone get notice that the other party is using these frequencies? So but there is a, there's a national controller. Every, uh, every, they are, they are regulators, I'll call them, yeah. So every nation has a regulator. In Ghana, we have the NCA, National Communications Authority. Okay. They are responsible for regulating the frequencies yeah. that we use, right? Oh, okay. And then the yeah. various national communication authorities, communication authorities uh, work uh, with the International Telecommunications Union, ITU, so that okay. they can coordinate their work, right? So yeah. if you wanted to uh, use this, you go to NCA, yeah. and then NCA will say, okay, we have this available, we can allocate you this channel space, and this is how much it will cost you. Okay. Thank you. The ramp. Any more? Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Any, any further questions? Um, I check, I swipe this. this thing. Okay. Please, you are leaving now. Sorry? Let me go out to it to log the door. I, I sent the key. I didn't know the class would come on. I was going home before.
online langsung langsung right okay now yes i'm listening yeah, I want to find out if there's going to be a practical question for this. Well, one of my things I will do in terms of this will be uh, simulations, which you should be able to do on your computers. Basically, you may have to write some code to do certain things using MATLAB or some other, uh, what do you call it, uh, or some other software. Am I clear? Yes, sir. So that means that there wouldn't be need for experience. No, no, there will not be need to tell people. Yeah, whatever lab work is there, it's something that you can do on your computer. Because we actually don't have any equipment to say that we are showing you, demonstrating to you how to do something. And definitely, I thought you can use your laptops, you know, as your lesson, because there are a number of things you can do on them. Is that okay? Okay. Come again. Yeah, I mean, if there will be any lab session, we will we'll let you know. I'll let you know. Yeah. Hello, sir. Yeah. Sir, please, what about if I'm using software defined radio in my house? Would the NCA be able to detect it? Well, <laughs> the issue is. If you, you are not interfering with anyone, yeah. they, they are not likely to know. Because it's when you begin to interfere with other people that they are aware that someone, the person who, has, who is licensed to use that band, yeah, okay. will then notice the interference or report to NCA that they can then track you. Because they are okay. scanning signal analyzers that they can use, go out there and check who is on what uh, frequency bandwidth. Yes. Please use it and trace you down okay. to where the signal is coming from. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, please, I want to ask uh, um, after each week or after each lecture, how do you get access to the course materials like the PDFs and then? And PowerPoint yeah, I think I've already uploaded uh, the lecture slides onto Sakai. Okay. So I don't know if you saw that notice, right? So you can okay. get it from me. The other way is that your course class rep can email me and I can send the slides to the class rep and then they can then distribute it to you. But uh, the, like this particular lecture, I've already uploaded the the what the material over there. Oh, okay, so okay. you can just do that, download it and use. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. The the other <laughs> thing uh, is not okay. every, it's not every week that I'll do a live lecture. So in some weeks, I may pre-record the lecture and then uh, upload it to Sakai. So in that case, you just download the lecture, but then because it might, you may find it boring, just listening to the a one hour, two hour uh, lecture. So what I might do, I'm likely to do is that I'll break the lecture down into let's say bits, 20 minutes, 10 minutes or whatever, yeah? So the lecture might span, there might be like four videos, which you then download and play and watch. In addition, there will be the accompanying slides to that video. Am I clear? Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so I'm going to do that as well. So it's not every week that I'll be there live, you know, uh, doing uh, this thing. Because I also find it difficult just sitting here and sort of talking to a screen without seeing people's faces, you know. <laughs> so yeah. So so uh, yes. if there are any more questions, we can continue. Is that right? Okay, yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, Prof. So we've been talking about modulation or ESA. Uh, if you really want to communicate, okay. Yeah, if you really want to communicate, 
then you need signals, right? And the, you, you need these signals to carry your message some way. So, and you do that through a concept known as modulation. So modulation simply means, uh, what do you call it? Um, you change a signal so that you can transmit useful data. So, so the act of changing a signal to enable you to transmit very useful data. So that's what modulation is. So in modulation, you have three things, or a number of things. You have your message signal. Yeah, so that's a signal that carries the information that has the information you want to send. So that signal may not be able to travel a long distance. So there's that signal. Then you also have what? A, a carrier signal. Yeah. So you can, you can call it a message signal, information signal. Then you have a carrier signal. The carrier signal is the one that actually takes that which you change yeah, with your message signal so that it can be transmitted. And this carrier signal uh, is of a much higher frequency. And that higher frequencies can go uh, longer distances. So modulation is the act of changing a signal to transmit useful data. And there are three aspects of a signal that you can modulate. So if you take any signal, and by signal here, I mean a sinusoid. Do you all know what a sinusoid is? Yes, bro. Okay. Yes, if you sir. don't, then you find out, yeah? It's, a, it's simply something that, that's great. It's a, it has a sine function. So, yeah, even though signals are, are around us everywhere, we can generate them. So we can generate this using equipment in the lab. And then you can generate the sinusoid, and then you can then impose this information signal onto that carrier signal you've generated. And there are three things about the signal that you can modulate here. Yeah? You can change the amplitude of the signal because if you take any sinusoid here, yeah, uh, sign signal, then that signal has an amplitude, it's got frequency, and it's got phase. So you can change any of these things, right? So by modulating, we mean changing those, uh, one of those things. So the amplitude is the power or intensity of the signal. The frequency is how often the signal repeats itself. And the phase describes where in the cycle the waveform is with respect to time. So these are the three things that you can change, you can modulate, yeah? But the question is, but why are we modulating? Why do we want to modulate? In order to understand that, why we they need to modulate, yeah, one of the reasons, there are many reasons why I want to modulate, uh, but one of the reasons is to actually for you to do a small calculation, right? Uh, so, so you all know that antennas can be used or are used in the, are used in the transmission and reception of signals, right? And I'm going to give you some basic facts. Well, if you have an audio signal. An audio signal is the frequency range, like we are talking frequency range of say five kilohertz, yeah? So when I'm talking normally, you are talking normally, it's around five kilohertz, yeah? So we are supposed to calculate the length of an antenna, which we, need, which we require in order to what? Receive an audio signal, yeah? If it is known that the antenna length is a quarter of the wavelength. So for you to receive that audio signal, your antenna must be a quarter of the wavelength. Now, you have 10 minutes to do to solve this problem. 
So uh, I'll give you 10 minutes. I'll just uh, take a break and then you can solve the problem. And then you can, uh, after 10 minutes, so what time is it now? 7.20, let's say 7.27. So let's say at 7.35, uh, I'll be expecting your answers. So first of all, you must find the relationship, yeah, between uh, frequency, because I'm giving you that information. I say the audio signal is at a frequency of what? About five kilohertz. And frequency is related to what? Wavelength, you know that. Yeah. Yes. So if you know the frequency, that means you know the wavelength at which the audio signal is. Now, if you know the wavelength, and then you should know the length of the antenna because you are saying that the antenna must be what? A quarter of the wavelength. Am I clear? Am I clear? Yes, sir. No. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You should be able to find Google the answer I find <laughs> in less than five minutes. Prof. Yes. So uh, are we to calculate for the wavelength? I didn't get the question right. Yes, yeah, so you, what you're actually supposed to do is work out the wavelength of an audio signal. You must assume that the audio signal is five kilohertz. Okay. Because I'm giving you that information. Okay. Audio signals they are in a certain range. Yeah, your human ear, we can hear from as low as three kilohertz, and some to about twenty-two kilohertz. So if you, I don't know, guys, if you are interested to in music and you buy uh, musical systems, do you do that? Yes, in, in my day, when I was a Me student, too. when I was a student, we go and buy. Uh, musical systems you buy like these days you don't do decks amplifiers uh, so we buy something that will play music uh, LP those, uh, ten tables we don't have them anymore and then when we go to buy those things we look at the specifications yeah so they will tell you that uh, you you buy like a, a speaker yeah when you buy a speaker do you actually look what uh, reach the specs the frequency range of the speaker. Do you do you take notes, or you just buy it because it looks nice? Well, we, we don't take notes. Maybe yeah, for I, I think <laughs> sometimes we, we, we just look at the, at the at the number of watts. Let's say thousand watts or two thousand or thousand five watts. Uh -huh. But you so, but you must also look at the fidelity. Yeah. Uh, you look at the fidelity of the of the signal. Okay, how what quality sound can it reproduce? What frequencies can it pick? And how what frequencies can it give out? Those are important because if it cannot give you a good frequency, then it means that a lot of the signals will be lost. So it could not be able to reproduce the music that you want. So you, sometimes you notice that you go to some party, the speakers, some speakers, they sound clean. Other speakers, haven't you noticed that? Yes, sir. I think it's because of the, the fidelity of the speaker, the, the sort of sound frequencies it can reproduce. Now, the human ear can pick up to, from let's say three kilohertz to about 22, kilo, uh, 22 kilohertz. Yeah? From, yeah, is it? Yeah, yeah, to about 22 kilohertz. This is what you can pick. Right? Beyond that, very few people can hear beyond 28. If a frequency is higher than 28, many people will not hear, right? You won't hear it at all. So the question is, if you have a speaker, a sound system that has a fidelity of, can give you up to say 45 kilohertz, do you need it? Well, you can hear it. You don't need it. You are paying for something that is not useful to you. Maybe your dog will hear it or your cat, <laughs> but you will not hear that music, you know, if it's at that range. Right, so an audio signal, assume that it's at five kilohertz. So when you speak normally, so that five kilohertz, what is the wavelength? So you can work out the wavelength from there. And then once you know the wavelength, you can then say, okay, so uh, the antenna length mass is this, you know. So I leave you to do that. Uh, and uh, I'll talk to you in two minutes.
Yeah, hello, please. If someone gets a question right, then the person real quick. You're not being selfish here. We can share. Yeah, I don't really understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, first, what you need to do is find uh, out. Uh, uh, prof, yes. What are the parameters? Hey, uh, the uh, only thing you know or you need here is one, the frequency of an audio signal. Yes. Once you know that, then you can solve the other thing. Once you know that, and, then and the that's five you need kilohertz. To Hello. Yes. yes. You need to know the relationship between frequency and wavelength. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Prof. Mm -hmm. I think uh, by using the five kilohertz, we can find the wavelength. Yes. Uh, we can find the wavelength of 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 uh, the audio of the yes. audio signal, and then yes. we will by uh, we'll multiply it by one over four to get the yes. antenna. Yes. Hello, so, bro. I, yes. Please, so, mini, uh, can we assume that we maybe we can use other five kilohertz or any you any 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 level? Kilohertz. We all have the same thing. Oh, okay, sir. Okay. Sir. Or if you want, I mean, we could have used the stream ends, and then you know what the shortest and what will be the longest. But let's just use oh, okay, five. Sir. You know. Oh, okay, sir. So the next thing you need to know is the relationship between frequency and wavelength. It's a simple relationship. You should have even yes, studied sir. that in, physics in high school. Um, I don't you that. <laughs> so the, the, the frequency will be the uh, sensitive uh, uh, factor divided Sorry. by the wavelength. Come again. I said, is, is it? Uh, I, I was asking whether it will be the the frequency uh, formula will be the the velocity factor over the wavelength in meters. What what velocity factor? What velocity? <laughs> Google will put you in trouble. Okay, so um, I think the the formula that um, like the wavelength form formula that uh, we are seeing on See. Google is. Um, mm -hmm. A wavelength yeah. is equal to a velocity over frequency. So, um, yes, the, yeah, um, but yes, the but figures that... I'll tell you something. Okay. The frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional. Proportional. <laughs> yeah. So the frequency is inversely proportional to the wavelength, and the constant of proportionality, yeah. Yeah? Yes, uh, is you know, the speed of light. Okay. You got that? So yes, I'll give sir. you a Uh, yes, 1.25 kilohertz. Sorry? 1.5? I was saying 1.25 kilohertz. 5 kilohertz. Mm. It can be kilo. The unit of measurement cannot be kilohertz. We want yes. the length of an antenna. <laughs> Okay. okay. Yeah, the length of something. 
Okay, it's, it, it must be in meters. meters. Either meters or kilometers or something of that nature. Mm, hello, sir. Oh, so, no, will no. it be 14.999 kilometers? I, I have not worked it out, but I don't think it's 14. Well, yeah, may, maybe you are close. Maybe one point, you know. Uh, I got to 1.25. Sorry? 1.25. Uh, 1.25 uh, because what, what value are you using for speed because of light? if what value are you using for speed of light? I think it will be three times ten to the power eight meters per second. Three times ten to the power of eight meters per second. Per Thank second. you. Yeah. Okay, so you're using three times ten to the power of eight meters per second. Per second. Yes, sir. Right. So you go to divide that by what? Four. We are using five as a <laughs> five. five kilohertz. Yes, sir. And what is five kilohertz? Five thousand hertz. Five times three to the power of uh, five times ten to the power of three, isn't it? That's yes, five thousand hertz. Yeah. Is that correct? So yes. In? Yeah, five times ten to the power of three. So yes, then, sir. if you say the wavelength. L equals to three times 10 to the power of what? Eight divided by five times 10 to the power of three. Yeah? Yes, you can do the indices. 10 to the power of eight divided by 10 to the power of three will be what? 15 <laughs> times. 10 to the 10 power to of the power eight five. divided by 10 to the power of three. What will be the answer left? 10 to the power uh, of five. Of five because yeah, it's yeah, subtracting indices, isn't it? Yes, sir. So now you have 10 to the power of five. Yeah. Take one yes, zero from there and add to the three. That gives you 30. So 30 times 10 to the power of four. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Now that, that 30 you then divide by what? By five. Is yes. that right? Six times 10 exponents four. Six. Yeah. So six times 10 to the power of four. One quarter. Is that of correct? Now that's it now is the wavelength, isn't it? Times 10 to the power of four meters, yeah? Now then you then you say the antenna length is a quarter of the wavelength. So the wavelength is 10 times, six times 10 to the power of what, four, which is what, 60,000 meters. Am I making sense? Yes, yes please. please. So now, so six then divided by four, so yes. you have said that the, the uh, antenna length must be a quarter of the wavelength. So if you divide that, you get what? 1.5. Six divided by that is 1.5. Yeah, is that right? 1.5 times 10 is 4. So the answer is 1.5 times 10 to the power of what? 4. Uh, 4, which works out like 15,000 meters. Yeah, meters. Yeah. And that's how much? 15,000 is what? 15 kilometers. Yes, mm -hmm. 15 kilometers. 15 kilometers, yes. Do you appreciate the thing now? So sure. it means that if you wanted to simply use the audio signal, yeah, as it is, you need to design your antenna so that they are 15,000 kilometers long, 15 kilometers long for you to be able to receive this signal. Is that practical? Yes, Prof. Yeah. No. no, not at all. No, that's not practical. It's not practical. Not practical at all. So now let's change the design and say now, supposing that we want to change the signal from the, the audio signal, we move it to a higher frequency. Let's move that to, let's say, uh, what? From five kilohertz to what? Five megahertz. Yeah? If you did five megahertz, then how, how long would that ever be? <coughs> we simply added uh, a thousand, yeah. So we can take the thousand off from the fifteen, yeah. So instead of fifteen thousand meters, you have fifteen meters. Yes. So the antenna will simply be fifteen meters, yes. simply by changing the frequency from what five kilohertz to five megahertz, right? Now, if you then push that to what the gigahertz. Then you see that the antenna length will even be shorter. 
Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. So there are practical reasons why we need to modulate, right? And one of them is the antenna length. Another reason is that you have the ability to transfer huge amounts of information using a single carrier frequency. You know, because at higher frequencies, you have a greater bandwidth. You can have a, an increased transmission length, so you can transmit over longer distances. You can also do more because by modulating, you know, you can have several uh, signals uh, being transmitted on the, along the same, but you can multiplex them. And the shorter area length we said, modulating, you can put in, a, through modulation, you can uh, encode the signals and put in security fence in there. And ultimately, mm -hmm. that's what we need, uh, uh, a better quality of service. So modulation is a process of our transfer information signal to a higher frequency carrier. So we can classify it into various forms, yeah? Continuous wave modulation or pulse modulation. And then for the continuous wave modulation, we are looking at amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, and phase modulation. For pulse modulation, it uses periodic sequences of rectangular pulses. And this can, those pulses can either be analog or digital, you know. So in analog pulse modulation, we can either pulse amplitude, we can either pulse position, or we can have pulse duration. But we normally, for uh, this, we normally focus on code pulse code modulation. But the question is, well, what is a signal? I mean, you can define a signal in terms of being a single value function of time. So a signal is a function of time, meaning that at any particular time, it has one specific value. You can also express it in terms of frequency. You know, it can be one dimensional, such as speech, music or computer data. It can be two dimensional, such as pictures, or it can be three dimensional, uh, such as video. It may even be four dimensional, you know, in which there's volume over data. There are a few concepts with the time domain that uh, you should know. Uh, so an analog signal will vary, you know, uh, in a smooth fashion over time. So with an analog signal, there are no breaks or discontinuities in the signal. You know, the signal just varies smoothly over time. Uh, but for digital signals, uh, it would maintain a certain intensity and constant level for a period and then to drop or change, you know, instantaneously. Signals can either be periodic, which means they repeat over time or aperiodic. And there's an interesting question I normally ask students about an aperiodic signal. So if you say something is aperiodic, what do you mean? That the signal, if you say a periodic signal, you all understand, meaning that what the signal repeats itself. But what about aperiodic signal? What does that mean? Any suggestions as to what that means? An aperiodic signal, what is it? Well, well, my understanding is the signal could change over time. For a periodic? Yes. It doesn't, uh, you don't have the same signal. Uh, a, signal it it uh, a signal that does not repeat the feet. Yes. Uh -huh. That's yeah. interesting. It's it really not having a pattern. Yes. So yes. a periodic signal is one that repeats itself. You can see the repetition pattern. Yeah. Uh -huh. The a periodic signal so is a signal that cannot. Uh, that doesn't repeat itself. And that is why I have a question. How do you know it doesn't repeat itself? Have you observed it long enough to know that it doesn't repeat? <laughs> Maybe it repeats after a million years. Do you understand my thing? Yes, sir. Yeah. 
So when you define an aperiodic signal, it means that you must define it to take care of that. So you, you may say something that, oh, uh, an aperiodic signal is a signal that does not repeat itself over observable time. So that meaning that is over a time that you can observe. Yeah, if beyond that time it's repeating, you don't know. <laughs> so we, we say something is aperiodic, but we, we really haven't observed it to infinity. So we cannot say for certain that, you know, it's, it's not repeating. Of course, this is what we say in textbooks everywhere. I read it also. This is what I studied in school. But growing up, I think about it and I'm asking myself those questions. Ah, basically, it's not repeating. But how for over what period have you observed this thing? I know that it will never repeat. Can you prove that it doesn't repeat? I mean, I don't know. Do you know the problem concerning the number pi? Who no, knows anything concerning pi? It has recurring uh, the small figures. A pi has yes, recurring. It, it is a non-terminating. A non. I think it's a non-terminating uh, number. Not recurring, uh, but non-terminating. But has anybody been able to prove that that is non-terminating? Mm. By using the long division. No, 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 no. That's not the People are searching for a proof. Do you understand that? People are trying to prove that, yes, it is indeed non terminating. Because it's not, it's not recurring. Nobody seeing the pattern and say, okay, after this, and so we can say, okay, it's recurring. But it's not terminating. But can we prove that it doesn't actually terminate? That's the question. Maybe someone may be interested in that, want to do a proof later on in life. I don't know. So an aperiodic signal is an analog or digital signal that doesn't repeat over. So instead of over time, over observable time, I would have said. Yeah. So instead of simply saying it doesn't repeat over time, you know, uh, over observable time. So for every signal, you can have the peak amplitude, which is the maximum value or the strength of the signal over that time. And we'll normally measure this in volts. And this is important. The amplitude is important. The voltage is important. Because you see, when you design wireless systems, right, uh, say an AM system, right, because you modulate the amplitude, you are modulating the voltage. So any noise, any voltage from anywhere goes into that, so it disturbs it. So we'll see that later on. So we also have the frequency rate uh, in cycles per second. So frequency is measured in the number of cycles per second. And one cycle per second is known as a hertz. And this is important because I've seen uh, some of you teach in schools and other things, and then you may define the hertz in some ways that is not very accurate. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's simply not uh, cycles over time, but every second per second. A head is a number of cycles per second. So a period is a, the time it takes for one repetition of a signal. And there you see the relationship between what period, yeah, which is the uh, what do you call it? And frequency, which is the uh, sort of the wavelength. Yeah. Phase is a measure of the relative position in time within a signal period of a signal, a single period of a signal. A wavelength is a distance occupied by a single cycle of the signal, or the, the distance between the two points of corresponding phases, you know, within a signal.
Now, we have a channel over which you transmit your signal. And that channel has you know, some, um, a certain capacity, right? And there are a number of things that can affect or distort the signal. So these impairments can limit the data rate. So by channel capacity, you mean the uh, sort of the maximum rate you know, at which your data can be transmitted under certain specified conditions within the channel. So that's your channel capacity. So what's your maximum data rate you know, that you can achieve over that communication path, you know, under certain conditions. There are a number of other terms such as data rate, bandwidth, noise, error rate, et cetera, which you should, I'll leave for you to find out. So we measure channel capacity using the Nyquist relationship for noise free, right? So the channel capacity is two times the bandwidth uh, log the power of, I mean, log M. M is the number of levels. Then we also have the channel capacity, which is measured as, so that Nyquist one is for a noise free system. But the channel one, who, who, who has said about channel? Cloud channel, the name is Cloud channel. Anybody heard about him? You should have told you about Klaus Shannon when you were studying computer science level 100. Mm. Cloud, C L A U D. Prof, yes. Cloud. So if you've not heard of him, go and find out a bit about him. He, he is known as a father of information theory, right? And he developed a number of relationships that we use still to date. And the he developed them when he was doing his masters, just like you guys. So if he could do it, you could also do it. Yeah. So Cloud developed this relationship for channel capacity for a noisy channel. So the bandwidth log one plus the signal to the noise ratio. And we'll see how to use this things later on in the course. Now, there are a number of mathematical concepts uh, that we need to know. Uh, and these are the, some of the factors that can uh, affect the performance of a, a wireless system. And these are to do with random processes and probability. You know, uh, so there are many factors that would influence the performance of wireless channel in a mobile networking system. And these include the density of the mobile stations in a cell. Well, you see that, that, I mean, it's obvious that that is a, you know, a random process. So, because if you're all connected to a particular cell, you're in a, you don't know who is going to come in and who is going to walk off. Do you know that? So that's a random process. You don't know whose battery is going to go off or who's going to switch on their phone because if you're there, you run out of battery. So your battery, you go, so you get out of the network. So the density of the cell, the mobile stations within a cell is a probability thing. Then the speed and direction of the mobile stations is also a probability thing. We don't know. It's, we don't know at what speed you are moving. You know, we don't know the direction. We don't know how many calls are to be taking place at any particular time. But all of these things would affect the performance of the network. So you need to be able to model the understanding. You see, and I don't know if you're appreciating this, you know, you have designed a system. Okay, I'll give you a good example, yeah? When we started lectures on Monday, right? Sakai wasn't working, was he working? Were you able to get in Sakai? Many people couldn't get into Sakai. I don't know how many people managed to get into Sakai, but Sakai was horrendously slow because there were no, so many people trying to get in. Now the system wasn't designed or they didn't put a lot of thought into designing the system such that it can cope with a huge number of people. What I heard later was that uh, 
And you can tell me if that is a plausible excuse that on Monday, when the students' lectures had begun, and tens of thousands of students were trying to log on to Sakai and they couldn't get access, I heard that, uh, well, it was a DOS that was being mounted against the university. Do you all know what a DOS is? And on campus is, yeah. Anybody knows what a DOS is? No. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Denial of service attack. Denial of service, yes. yes. I mean, how, how possible is that reason? On Monday, Sakai couldn't work. Okay? But we know that thousands of students were trying to get access and they couldn't gain access. And they couldn't gain access because we are told it was a DOS that was being launched against the university. Does that sound like a plausible excuse? Uh, no. Not at all. So is it these students who are launching the attack? Because a DOS is when many people try to access a network or you, people try to, uh, someone intentionally, you get many people access it, trying to access the network, so you slow it down and break it down, isn't it? Yes. And then we expect thousands of students to be assessing the network. So it wasn't a denial of service attack. It was simply that the network was not designed. The Yes, to cope with that. They didn't do that. Right? So, when you design your systems, you must give thoughts to the frequency, how many people will be using that at maximum capacity. How often the calls will be coming? If you don't give thought to that, that's, uh, it will break down. You must give thought to the number of calls that will be taking place at the same time. Now, Kojo is in the house doing the other thing. Amma is also in the house doing her work. You don't know when they will decide to make a call or how many of them want to make a call at the same time. Do you? So that is a purely probabilistic thing. It's a random thing. You don't know how long Kojo is going to stay or Kwame is going to stay on, on the phone talking. Maybe he's got a new girlfriend. He's going to chat her up. Whilst you know you want to talk to me and I don't have time for you, so as soon as you call, say yes, hello, what can I do for you? All right, bye bye then. Thirty seconds, I'm done with you. So these are all probabilistic things. The, the position of the mobile stations with respect to each other, to the base station. You know the type of traffic that we expect on the network, whether it's real time traffic or you know non real time traffic. At times, you simply want to send data. You know, you have to send uh, pictures or something, message. So this is not on real time. And sometimes you want to do like a WhatsApp call. So all of these things would affect the system performance. So you need to be aware of them. And we will try and do some calculations around that. Okay. Yes. Can you please uh, explain uh, the position of the mobile stations with respect to each other? Yes, because and then yes, because you see, wherever the mobile stations are, right, with respect to each other, today, this will affect the signal strength that you must uh, you must send, right? Uh, so. The, the further it is away from the uh, base station, the, pump, the, pump, the more power you need to get the signal across to that place, right? The closer they are to each other, the likelihood that they will do uh, cross, uh, they will cross interfere with each other. So we don't know where people will be making their calls, you know? So this, basically that is what it is. You don't know where all of this is because is if you know that uh, distance are in a particular direction or place, you might want to focus, uh, do a, a, what do you call it? Beam forming and send the beams in a particular direction so that you can uh, uh, deal with those people or uh, sort them out. Am I clear? Of oh, if, if it's about the, the power, is it not dependent on the, on the mobile station and the, uh, so long as it's on, mm -hmm. uh, does it not give the same amount of power? So yes, if it's so, how does it then affect the wireless performance? Wait, 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 wait. 
the mobile stations are certain places. Right? But then if you're on call, remember that you are connected to a base station and the base station will send you information signals as well, right? So the base, the, the, the base stations, their power here have been designed to operate within a certain limit. Mm -hmm. So if you are at the edge of that cell, then you'll be receiving less of that power than when you are closer Okay. Am I clear? Yes, Prof. I, I please get to know. So traffic in adjacent sizes and frequency of handoffs, all of this is to affect this. So these are all probabilistic trends that we know very little. So there, there must be ways and models of calculating those things. <laughs> So there are a number of models that are used. You know, you can use deterministic models or stochastic models. Uh, 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 for the communication systems, they receive signal, you know, they read the information bearing signal, which is the one that actually the, the what you are interested in. There is a noise, the interference itself, the signal that does the interference. And then there's also tunnel noise. So noise within the tunnel itself. So since all of this is a random processes, you sort of need to look at random processes a little bit, you know, for any random processes, you know, any random process, there are two things that define it. One is a function of time. So once the random process, it means it becomes a function of time. And it's also impossible to define exactly the waveform that will be observed in the future because you don't know. And each outcome of a random experiment is associated with some sample point or sample space, you know, uh, so some sample point. And when you aggregate all of these sample points, you then get the sample space. So you can think of all the probability, the possibilities, and you aggregate them, and then you then come up with some measure or metric which you can use. I don't think I want to go any more into details about this at this point, but it's just to let you know that uh, these are the things that uh, underpin uh, the things that we want to look at, that you may have to look at, All right? Um, but I wouldn't go any more into that. So I think I'll end it here. And uh, we have the, this is, the slides are already there for you. And then next week, we will begin to look at modulation itself. Uh, the next topic will be modulation. I'll upload the lectures uh, as and when I can. And then I'll then try to do the video lecture. If I'm not going to see you, I'll do the video lecture. And then you can see that as well. Any questions? Sir. Hello, sir. Yes, I'm listening. Um, please, I just check the Sakai and um, on your side, I couldn't find the resource material. You couldn't find that? Yes, please. I thought I did that too. I did that was yesterday. Or the it's day. blank. There's a folder, but it's empty. Yes. And the resources. Did you see other resources? Yes. Yes. But it's empty. It's empty. Yes, it's empty. empty. It means it didn't load. There was a folder called lectures, is that right? Um, yes, I mean. I remember creating that and loading it. The, the, the folder name is CSCD60931. Yeah. Yeah. The course code, then resource. That, get that. Yes. When you click on it, it's the same thing that counts. Hey. Yes, please. I'll check. Uh, I'll check it. Then let me let me see if I can do it right now. Okay, sir. Thank you. I'll, I'll check because I did that yesterday. Oh, sir. Yes, sir. My question. Yes, go ahead. 
Um, please, um, since uh, we will not be having face-to-face -face class, mm -hmm. I want to ask how uh, our assignments and group work will be assigned to us. The assignments, you, you, you email them. Okay, okay, sure. Hello, sir. Yes. Can you please recap the PSTN structure again? Come again. The PSTN structure. The what? The PSTN. The uh, uh, public switch telephone. Yes, please. I didn't get it well. Well, the public switch telephone network is, a, is, a, is the existing infrastructure network that connects. Uh, the, the land lines in the country, yeah. right? Yeah, yes. And then you then get your mobile systems, yeah, being connected to it through the mobile switching centers. Okay, sir. And this is what allows for you to be able to what make calls to land lines, even though land lines don't have wireless capability. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, two, uh, your call is two, uh, 609. Resources. You can see my screen, isn't it? And then. Yes, yes, yes please. There's nothing there. You're right. Yeah. Upload files. Let me hear. I did this yesterday. Can you see it now? Yes, a minute. Eh? Yeah, they are showing. They are showing now. Yeah. Yes. Okay. They are there now. Yes. Excellent. So let me do another one. Uh, This uh the the, the video recordings from the main students, so you can watch that as well. Right. Any any more questions? Hey, is it when the videos are long? It's difficult to Hello, watch. Bro. Yes. When the videos are long, it's Hello, to watch. Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. Oh, okay. Please, the, the calculation on the antenna length. Mm -hmm. uh, please, uh, I don't know whether in, in the materials that you upload, you can, you can come across the no, I didn't do I didn't do it there. The, it's, it's, the calculation no, I, the formula I didn't do it there because oh, okay so okay you, you are find you find it difficult to understand eh? you find that difficult uh, and uh, the relationship yes the the relationship yes, the relationship is that that's the calculation the, uh, the formula for calculation the, the frequency is inversely proportional to the wavelength which means that F yes. equals to 
or not equals to uh, proportionality, you know, something over wavelength. Yeah. So you can, and then that concept of proportionality is, is the speed of light. So frequency equals C over lambda, where lambda is speed of light. So where lambda is wavelength. Yeah. So if you want to find okay, lambda, yeah. if you want to find lambda, you interchange the position with frequency. Okay. Okay. So, so lambda, uh, change your subject. Yeah. Exactly, change of subject. So uh, lambda equals to C over yeah. F. And C, you know, is three times 10 to the power of eight meters okay. per second. And frequency is uh, what uh, is measured in uh, the number of cycles per second. So the seconds will cancel out but, if you the seconds will cancel out and the rest of it, you know. Okay. Thank you. So, for that, so uh, yeah, I've got the material there for you now. You can look at it and uh, read it. Uh, if there are no more questions, thank, I'll say thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Uh, it's, it's not a very nice way of doing the class, you know. If we were sitting in a real class, uh, I could see your faces, maybe bully you a little bit, give you some knocks on the head, but uh, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask me to help me. Prof. It, Hello, Prof. You yes, can I try can. this. Which one? Yes. I only break my screen, so I don't want to try. <laughs> uh, Hello, Prof. I'm listening. Prof, how do I send? Should I send a recorded video to you? Or you also have it? Well, I, I, I should have it because I think I also press recording, but I really don't need it. It's oh, you okay. need it. Mm. What oh, I've okay. done is I've recorded on Sakai uh, the, the one that I did with the in the real class, the in full class, because we are, I'm teaching you exactly the same thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you can watch that. Mm. And I'm fine. Okay. Mm. All right then. So thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. And sorry about the you know the confusion. I went to campus to try and do the class from my office, and then when I got there, the network wasn't working, so I decided to come back home. Uh, it takes me a bit of time uh, to get home to join. Other than that, I couldn't even have joined the, live, the class today live because I wanted to do it from the office and uh, it wasn't the best of experience. You know. So yeah. this is why uh, sometimes because of the network issue, I want to sometimes at least record, do the recording down and where I'm not able to join, I will simply upload the video recordings. So you watch that if you have any questions, you send those to me. Lord, do you want to speak, say something? Yes, but um, I want to make a quick suggestion. Come again, go ahead. Yeah, um, for the sake of... You, you, are very, you, are, you are very low. We can't hear you. Can you. No. Hello, sir. Yes. Hello, sir. I was suggesting that you were suggesting that. I think you need to increase your volume from your mic. Volume is down. You should go into the system and. Um, I think. I think he can, um, whatever question uh, he has, he can just type it and then. Yes, he can it type it. Here. No, why don't Someone you type it in the chat? I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, there are so many questions here or comments. Uh,